Now more than 200,000 Ukrainians could be allowed to join family members already in the, U the UK after the government expands their visa scheme for refugees leaving that country. However, there are calls for the government to waive the visa requirement altogether and instead introduce a flexible and pragmatic approach to allow Ukrainians to seek temporary refuge in the UK. The Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, joins us now. Um, very good morning to you, Mr Wallace. Good morning. Um, as well, we, we'll talk about the visas in just a moment. I just want to uh, address this desperate feeling amongst people particularly those people in Ukraine and the Ukrainian diaspora, that we're not doing enough militarily. Yesterday, Boris Johnson was challenged emotionally by Daria Kalenyuk. She spoke to us on this programme this morning, who says we have a duty to help the people of Ukraine. Uh, for those viewers who haven't seen, let me just play this exchange. Kiev in particular facing aerial bombardment. Why do we not put in a no-fly zone? Well, I think, first of all, to put in a no-fly zone, you have to enforce it because the Russians wouldn't uh, comply with it voluntarily. Uh, and that would mean British, French, German fighter jets enforcing it by shooting down Russian aircraft. They would retaliate. They've got lots of anti-air missiles, etc. That would trigger a NATO Article 5. And under NATO, those countries in NATO, that's 30 nations, will come to the aid of any member who triggers this Article 5 self-defence clause. So very rapidly, we would go from a war in Ukraine to a war right across Europe, and indeed with the United States and Canada as members of NATO, and a war against Russia as a state. Now, that is a very difficult fact. It's, uh, it's, it's you know, I am not, therefore, blind to what I am seeing in Ukraine, both through intelligence pictures and indeed on the television screens and the passion of the Ukrainians. Uh, I visited that country five times as a minister and as a secretary of state. But that is the reality. U Ukraine is not in NATO. Uh, other countries, neighboring Russia, such as the Estonians and others, are in NATO and we are reinforcing them to send a very clear message. Can we but I'm not prepared to the trigger level a wider of civilian European war. casualties that we face. Look, there are going to be horrendous scenes. You know, I have not held back uh, on my media interviews in the last few days. There are going to be horrendous scenes because President Putin is not a man uh, with respect to human rights and human life, as we can see, not only just towards Ukrainians. His own soldiers are suffering because they were lied to and ill-prepared, and he has invaded a sovereign country. But the reality is the Russian military doctrine is goes from an invasion that we saw at the beginning. He made it based on an assumption that the Ukrainians were going to welcome them as liberators because he's convinced himself that he is the great leader of the ancient people of Rus and it's a small cabal of Nazis. You heard him talk about denazifying the country. Uh, he's got that massively wrong, which is why we're seeing the loss of life on both sides. Uh, but then once they don't get their way in the Russian military doctrine, they double down they put huge amounts of violence into the equation. The bombardment we see at night on countries such as, uh, sorry, cities such as Kharkov go on and on and on. We've seen it in other parts of the world. Uh, and he will do it until he thinks he can break the people. He can't uh, ben, break ben, the Ukrainians. Ben Wallace, sorry to interrupt you. W would you agree with me that um, the Russian uh, calculation, the Russian military approach is a war crime? The siege and starvation of men, women and children sheltering as they are now and being starved uh, uh, underground is by any assessment a war crime on any view. And given that's the case, how do you propose to ensure that the people of Ukraine and Kiev, Kiev are not starved? How do you propose to do airdrops to provide them with the things that they need unless there's a no-fly zone or unless the skies can be policed by the West? Well, I think... There are two parts to your question. The first part about do I consider what I see a war crime, I think, as you will know from your own legal background, we have to collect the evidence. Canada was declaring yesterday they are going to collect the evidence, and it has to be evidence, not anecdotal, and we have lots of ways of collecting that. Uh, we will do that. The ICC has said it's opened uh, a book. I'm not going to. I'm not. A, I'm not an international lawyer, so I'm going to be careful with the vocabulary. And again, as you know, I have to be very careful with the vocabulary. Uh, what I know is 
that the Russians have to comply with the Geneva Conventions, otherwise they do risk being prosecuted for war crimes, and not just the leaders of Russia, but the military leaders as well. And that's why last week we summoned the Russian defense attaché to the ministry, and I specifically made sure he was reminded of his obligations under the Geneva Convention. On the other bit about a, a, a no-fly zone, there is another half to this no-fly zone, which people are suggesting, because I understand why people are suggesting these type of uh, uh, solutions because they want to do something. They are desperate from what they see on the telly to try and make it better. I am no different from anybody else. The other part of the no-fly zone is if you have a no-fly zone, neither the Ukrainians nor the Russians can fly. Uh, and that means one of the few areas that the Ukrainians have or military capabilities to reach the Russians at longer ranges would be taken away from them and it would favour the overwhelming ground force of the Russian forces. Those armoured columns you see, uh, those uh, you know, long-range missiles, which they have huge numbers of missiles and artillery, are all ground forces. They would continue to bombard. They would, those armoured columns would be able to move far more freely than they do now because the Ukrainians could not fly and attack them from the air. So I'm not sure it was either a military advantage to have a no-fly zone at this present stage for the Ukrainians, and I'm also not prepared to risk a war across the whole of Europe with a nuclear power uh, based on the fact that, you know, we are there as NATO members to defend NATOs. But also I recognised, and this is, you know, this is something that I feel sad about. Britain has been a very early sponsor over a decade of trying to get Ukraine into NATO. We have helped them. We have trained them. Mm -hmm. But to get into NATO, you need all 30 members. Not everyone wanted to move at the same pace. But, you know, Britain has played a very strong part. Okay. And we all have to move at the same pace we, as everyone. And right are, now, we are supplying okay. those people with weapons. Meanwhile, we are not moving at the same pace as our uh, EU partners over waiving visas for those uh, who want to come to the UK. And uh, presumably many of them temporarily to flee what uh, they face. Um, you've doubled the number uh, that we're going to allow in. Why don't we just say, if you need to come, you're welcome. Well, I think, first of all, you know, we've doubled it to 200,000. We've broadened it out to people who are, you know, it's not just direct de descendants, it's not like your children and your wives. It's, it's a much broader group of people. We've also said, as I said, I think, day before yesterday on the programme, you know, we will, we will continue to review these uh, uh, arrangements depending on what we see. When, when I spoke to you two days ago, there was 150,000 uh, effectively refugees. That's gone up to over 600,000 now. So we are opening the aperture absolutely in the right direction. The second thing I would say is, you know, for the European Union, who borders Ukraine, uh, the, visa, the visa issue, and remember visas are sometimes about a security screen. We just have to make sure, you know, for protection of the UK, that we carry out basic checks, that the, the passport isn't forged or it is who they say they are. That's, that's not unreasonable for any country. But if you're a neighbouring country like Poland or Romania, you don't have time to, to do that if you've got 300,000 people immediately arriving. No one is going to immediately arrive in the UK at that scale. So, so I have insisted that visa processing is brought much closer to those borders so it can be done. People are allowed to cross into other countries to be processed, so it's not the case that they won't be allowed to come from Ukraine into those other countries. It won't be the case okay. that they're stuck. They will be able to come into safe areas and, you know, those neighbouring countries we will then do whatever processing is needed. But if there's, if there's an urgency or a need to even lift that, you know, we are absolutely open to doing that. And, you know, I'm delighted that we've gone up uh, yeah. in the numbers well, from a small I, amount yeah. to 200,000. I think viewers will hear the words, it's under review. You know, the... it, look, it's, it's constantly under. We have moved, if you look at the last five days, we have moved. But, you know, fundamentally, there are two challenges in the refugee flows. One is the immediate neighbouring country and how people get supported there. And we will absolutely okay. be increasing our humanitarian aid. And I hope the rest of the world does as well. And the second one is how do we make sure that we get people here when they come back to the UK uh, and that they are you know, supported, but also processed very, very quickly in those countries to get back. And do you seriously think the Home Secretary is correct that there are real security concerns, that there might be moonlighting Russian agents trying to flee for safety? You receive safety briefings. That doesn't seem like a sensible concern, does it, Minister? Well, look, I, I was a security minister and, you know, all borders uh, have a obligation uh, to make sure we know that the person presenting themselves is who they say they are. 
There are lots of reasons why people don't do that. I think that is not an unreasonable request that we make sure that, you know, if Ben Wallace turns up on a border, it is Ben Wallace. Uh, there are people who use migrant flows, not at scale, but there are people who use migrant flows to come in. You know, terrorists we've seen came through, uh, you know, across the channel. We've seen terrorists uh, come in in elsewhere. Look, there are very few terrorists in Ukraine. I think almost from my memory serves me right that it's a very, very low number of people that would use it as a border. But I think we just have to make sure. And it's, you know, my, my responsibility in defending the, the UK. The European aren't doing that, Minister. So they've got the, the same security concerns as we do. And uh, my intuition, and I may be wrong as a man of humanity, you can't possibly agree with the Home Secretary here. People don't have documents fleeing war zones. Um, this is not a security concern, a serious one. And my intuition tells me, and I suspect I'm right, you don't think so either. Well, look. We're all people of humanity, uh, nearly all of us, I, I think. So let, let, let's, let's not sort of divide it that way. I think the reality is we have to balance different responsibilities. You know, I'm responsible for the defence and security of the United Kingdom and her citizens and her allies, and we do everything we can to do that. I think the point is, as, as Susanna has made, you know, we are uh, reviewing this on a rapid uh, uh, speed. Those people will be able to be in a safe haven. They'll be across the border, and I have insisted that we make sure we process them close to where they are, without requiring them to trek across miles of any country to make sure we just establish their identity. I don't think that is an unreasonable thing to do, uh, and then uh, to bring them uh, here or, or uh, allow them to come to the United Kingdom. Kingdom. You know, Britain has actually been incredibly generous over the last two years, both with Chinese, you know, the, the Hong Kong nationals who we've brought over, well over 100,000 who have fled that persecution, the Afghan Arab scheme that I ran in the Ministry of Defence, the 15,000 we brought, brought out through op pitting and before then. We are there to welcome people. We are there to process them. We just want to make sure that some of the basic security screening is done. But, you know, we're into the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians that we're, okay. we're you know, pleased to take uh, and we'll continue to do so. Ben Wallace, Defence Secretary, thanks very much indeed.